morning. Good morning. That's better. My name's Ruth. I'm one of the pastors here, and I want to also give you a very warm welcome to Game 3 in our series, God Quest. So God Quest is a four-week series, um, and we're taking a little bit of a, a playful approach to engaging in activities that will um, hopefully help us to experience more of God in our everyday lives. Um, we're using this uh, analogy of a video game, and I know this is resonating better with some people than with others, so that's okay if you're not into video games, uh, just try and keep up. Um, no, it's, it's, um, it's a bit of a playful approach. Um, so we're imagining that we're characters in a game and our mission is to experience more of God. So in week one, game one, uh, we looked at how God actually fills every part of the game, fills every part of our world, of our universe even. Um, and we focused on just being more aware of God, who is all around us. Um, we also focused on um, taking note of those moments where we feel um, a sense of awe or uh, wonder or you know, something stirs us emotionally and re realizing that, that that maybe is an indication of God's presence with us. And we looked at putting ourselves into places where we feel more of that sense of wonder. And that's, of course, different for all of us. We're all very different people, different personalities. Uh, for some of us, that's about sunsets and staring up at the starry sky. For others of us, it's uh, listening to certain kinds of music or um, looking at beautiful art that really speaks to us. For others, the more science-minded, uh, maybe that's uh, study or doing something practical. We all experience um, that sense of wonder, that sense of otherness um, in different ways that's very special to us. But maybe that is um, a sense of God's presence with us. And then last week, week two, game two, uh, we looked at our mission, our mission of increasing the flow of love in the world by putting others first, by being patient and compassionate, uh, by looking for opportunities to serve um, in order to bring about our, our ultimate objective of the game, which is to bring healing and reconciliation to the world. And we get to, we get to do that with God. So if you miss those, they are available online. You can hear those messages. Um, and I think the great thing about this game is that we all get to play. Uh, so even if you're not into the game analogy still, that, that experience, of, that opportunity to experience more of God is available to all of us. So I'd really encourage you, to, if you haven't yet, to pick up a copy of the materials. It's just one sheet um, and play along um, and, and maybe have some fun, of, fun with it. This, of course, is a serious subject. I mean, maybe there's nothing more serious than experiencing more of God in our lives, um, but we try not to take ourselves too seriously, so we're having uh, something of a playful approach. Um, so this week, week three, game three, we are going to look at how we can experience more of God in ourselves. As if God fills the whole universe, then God must be in us too. But some of us, I think, really struggle with that. We struggle with seeing God in ourselves, God's presence in us. Um, and so we're going to use this video game analogy again and hopefully have a bit of fun with it. Um, so just to get a sense of the room, uh, hands up if you've ever played a video game, whether it's the arcade type or something on your phone or... Okay, so most of us, okay, that's, that's good. Uh, don't worry if you haven't, you'll, you'll still keep up. Um, who's played a character? I mean, some games it's just like, you know, you're hitting the fire button or whatever, but who's played a character that has a story? Hands up. Okay, a little bit less of us, okay. Um, so let's see how many uh, characters we know then from video games. You might know them from your kids, you might not have played them. I haven't played all these games, but who's this? Mario, okay, what about this one? So, oh, Kevin's doing a little bit suspiciously well here, you know. What about this one, Kevin? Oh, okay. <laughs> Anybody know who's this lady? Oh, back, back, back. Who's this one before? Who's this? Laura Croft, right? Okay, who is this one? Donkey Kong. Now, Donkey Kong should look like that to me. I, I think of Donkey Kong like that, right? A little bit older. I was like, what? Who is that? Okay, so Donkey Kong. Okay, so that for those of you who don't know your joystick from your trackball, don't worry. We're talking about characters today, um, and characters in video games, kind of similar to characters that you get, you know, in books or on TV or whatever. So we're just thinking about this, this idea of characters. So characters in video games tend to be a lot more athletic, right? They can run 
faster and jump higher and throw things further and all that kind of stuff. But apart from their kind of exaggerated uh, physical abilities, and any female characters seem to have very exaggerated uh, physical, uh, physical characteristics in general, to my, my view, but anyway, uh, apart from that, characters in video games are pretty similar to characters we would see elsewhere. A lot of characters have background stories, they have um, origin stories, things that tell you how they got to be where they are, how they got on the mission that they're on, what motivates them, you know, how they got their scars, how they got, you know, all their angst and, and what drives them, and that helps us to understand the character, right? And some of these backstories are very emotionally powerful and moving. Uh, Sonic the Hedgehog, for example, has a very tragic backstory. Um, he was an ordinary uh, hedgehog who uh, put on some power sneakers and then ran faster than the speed of sound on a treadmill in a, a scientist lab as hedgehogs do, um, and that caused an explosion as he went through the sound barrier and that fused Sonic's quills together and turned him blue by that well-known phenomenon, the cobalt effect. So um, obviously this is an everyday story, um, but at the same time it's very tragic, very tragic for Sonic. But that was a joke, it's not very tragic, okay, you can lighten up a little bit, it's okay. I know you're in church, but it's okay, you can, you can, you can laugh, thank you, thank you for those little laughs. Um, so learning a character's uh, history, their backstory, can actually help us to get into their mind. It can also change our perspective on characters, right? So Donkey Kong, he's kind of the iconic villain, right? In the older arcade games, he would uh, throw barrels down on Mario. He kidnapped uh, Mario's girlfriend, Pauline. For those of you who don't know, you don't know what you're missing out on. Great game. Uh, clearly, he's a very bad character, except... When you get to know his backstory, you find out that actually he's acting that way because Mario was very abusive to him, including keeping him in a very tiny cage, chained up. You look, you can see the cage is like not even as, you know, like one millimeter bigger than this poor animal. So then it makes you think, well, who really is the bad guy in the story? You know, it's pretty deep stuff. Which, of course, brings us to today's, story, to today's uh, message, right? Obvious um, connection. I promise it does. I'm not just being silly. Um, because although we're stretching this analogy way further than it's probably meant to go, we are all characters with backstories, right? We've all got to where we are from different paths. We all bear different scars for all kinds of reasons. Um, and maybe our backstory is not quite as tragic as, as uh, Sonic's or as, as misunderstood as Donkey Kong's, but we all have reasons for the way we are, uh, for how we got here, and uh, for what motivates us and so on. We have our own personal backstories. But we also have something of a collective shared backstory. So, so what is our shared backstory, our shared origin story? Well, let's go right back to the beginning, to Genesis, which of course means origin. Genesis chapter one. So God has created the heavens and the earth, day and night, sun, moon, stars, plants, fish, birds, and animals. And then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in, the li in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, God created them. So those words are probably familiar to some of us. We've read them before, maybe many times before. But what does it mean to be made in the image of God? Well, there are lots of different ways of understanding that phrase and that concept. In fact, there are a whole schools of thought, not just in Christianity, but also in Judaism and in some, some branches of Islam, of what does it mean to be made in the image of God. I think we have a slide for that. So, um, the way it would most probably be being understood by the original hearers, the original uh, readers, would have been in a functional sense. So, humanity was made to represent God, to function as God. And actually that's clear in the text of Genesis 1 where it says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule. So God is seen as a ruling over creation, and so then we are made in God's image, which means that we rule over creation. 
At the time when the book of Genesis was written, kings in the ancient Near East, so in the region uh, around uh, the community that's, that's writing Genesis, um, they would frequently be described as being in the image of a god. We have a picture of an Assyrian king. This is um, Esau Haddon. Esau Haddon ruled in uh, the 600s BCE um, in um, Assyria. And he was referred to, is referred to in various uh, inscriptions that we still have as being the very image of Bel. Bel was an Assyrian god. Uh, similarly, we know from the pharaoh at this time, the pharaoh was seen as a, a physical local incarnation of Ra, the Egyptian sun god. So in these cultures, the king, and only the king, um, out of all the people, was made in the image of the god, and therefore had the same authority as a god, um, spoke for the god, was worshipped as a god, represented the god in this functional way. I think that's interesting because I think today when we uh, hear that phrase, made in the image of God, we, we kind of go to this kind of very abstract, I think a little bit weak idea of, well, there's some kind of a divine spark in us, or maybe we have some kind of a, an ethereal soul, and that's what it means to be made in the image of God. But in the ancient Near East understanding of that phrase, that's a much closer, a much uh, deeper relationship to the God. But in Genesis, of course, it, it's different. It's not the king is made in the image of the God. This is all of humanity. So all of us get to represent and function as God in some sense. Humanity as a whole. So this was quite a revolutionary uh, thing to write in this, um, in this writing of Genesis. It was very democratizing. We're all made in the image of God. So that's the first way of understanding. Another way of understanding that phrase, a way that it's been interpreted, is that we have certain characteristics that God has. We share certain characteristics with God. And they could be things like uh, being rational. We reason, we speak, we apply logic. Um, we, we think that God is rational. Uh, and so maybe that's something that we share with God that the rest of, the rest of creation doesn't. Or morality. Uh, we seem to have an ingrained sense of what is right and what is wrong. And with actually very little deviation, relatively speaking, across time and, and, and geography, we're born with certain things of just, that's wrong, right? We have that sense. So maybe that's something that we have in common with God. Or maybe it's our aesthetic awareness. We have an appreciation of beauty. We're creative people. We, um, we have an appreciation, appreciation for a sense of order. Maybe that's something that it is to be made in the image of God. Or um, volition, free will. Uh, we don't just operate by instinct. We can think and, and, and analyze different, um, different trajectories of what we might do and choose. Uh, maybe that's an aspect that makes us uh, more like God. Or uh, religious capacity. We don't just focus on the here and now, but there's something in us that wants to reach beyond and see you know, what is there beyond this visible universe, etc. I mean, we, we could go on different characteristics that people say, well, that's what it means to be made in the image of God. Things that are true for people that are not true uh, for the rest of creation. And maybe that's true. I mean, we, we, we kind of really can't say, right? Traditionally, Christianity has been very quick to say that humans are way higher than the rest of creation, that we have attributes like these, um, these godly attributes, uh, and we were created to rule, and therefore we can do what we like with creation. Uh, rather like those ancient Near East kings who thought, well, I'm deity, so I can treat the people as I want, I can enslave people, I can, I can tell them to do what they want because I, I am made in an image of God. Um, Clearly, that can be very toxic, right? That could, uh, when we separate ourselves off from the rest of creation, put ourselves above, we can, uh, we can, cre we can uh, live and operate in very damaging ways for the rest of creation. And I think if we read more of scripture, we see very clearly that the idea of ruling in Genesis 1 and the idea of tending a garden in Genesis 2, in both those concepts, it's not about uh, kind of being a dictatorial ruler, but it's about responsibility, it's about care, uh, rather than exploitation and, and kind of reckless uh, disregard for the consequences. Also, of course, we don't really know to what extent uh, animals share in these characteristics. Uh, we're finding new things out all the time about creation. 
I don't know if any of you have uh, read this book. This is a New York Times uh, bestseller, The Hidden Life of Trees. Um, this book is about how trees actually grow in communities. Uh, they use underground fungal networks to exchange information and to share resources, to share uh, water and nutrients. Um, and they actually take care of trees that are sick or are struggling and, and supply them with extra nutrients. And there are some pretty amazing examples in this book of trees communicating with one another. So for example, if a giraffe comes and starts to eat the leaves uh, on an African acacia tree, the tree will release a gas that trees nearby will sense. And when they sense this gas, they immediately start producing a toxin that makes their leaves taste bad. Pretty amazing, pretty wild thing. Um, all that to say, I'm not saying that, that trees are made in the image of God, all I'm saying is that I don't think we know, maybe as much as we think we do, about the abilities and the limitations of creation. Perhaps there are ways that we don't know about in which other created beings experience uh, and interact with God. We don't know. So maybe we just need a, a dose of humility to counteract that we are made in the image of God. But regardless of how unique we are, we are unquestionably, as humans, truly amazing. For example, although our sense of smell um, is much less developed than it is for some animals, your nose can detect a trillion different scents, a trillion, and you can remember about 50,000 of them. Smell, as we know, is very closely associated with memory and with emotions in general, actually positive and negative. Um, you can catch a whiff of something and you're transported back to another time and place and you can often feel the emotions um, from that time and place. Uh, for example, the bathroom over here, uh, actually the soap smells of marzipan. I know marzipan's not a big thing in America. It is in England. Um, we always had marzipan on our birthday cakes. Whenever I smell that soap, I'm in, yes, got another English person going, yes. Um, so as soon as I smell that soap, I feel happy. And I, and I hate marzipan, it tastes horrible. But it means birthdays and it's happy and the family's together and it's a really happy thing. So uh, scent can do that to us. Um, and less positively, there's, there's a saying that you can smell fear. Actually, that's completely true. Um, you can, um, studies have shown that if you smell a sweat sample from someone who was afraid, you will measurably, your sense of anxiety will increase. It's, it, it's proven. It's amazing. Uh, another example, the human eye can distinguish about 7 million different colors. Some of us, not so many actually, if <laughs> you're colorblind, but so, uh, they can up to about 7 million different colors. Um, if the human eye were a digital camera, it would have 576 megapixel, mix, megapixels. By way of comparison, the new iPhone 11 has 12 megapixels. And if you get the super duper top of the line high resolution Canon camera, that has 50 megapixels. Our eyes have 576 equivalent. Pretty amazing. And just like our sense of smell uh, with, with fear and some, some other emotions like disgust, you can, you can smell it and you, you begin to feel it. Um, so our eyes can mi uh, mirror what people are feeling. So imagine someone you really love and you watch them and they hit their thumb with a hammer. What do you do? Flinch, right? You flinch or you say ow. And, and people will sometimes physically feel pain that's measurable in the brain when they see somebody else uh, that they care about being, being hurt. So visual stimulus can trigger uh, what are called mirror neurons in your brain and you will actually um, feel something of what that other person is going through. It's by, you know, it's by watching something you in some ways become one with the person that's experiencing it. That is amazing, right? I think it's amazing. And we could go on, we could talk about how we have 100,000 miles of blood vessels in each of our bodies. Um, we have 70,000 different thoughts that we process each day, etc., etc. You get the idea. We are amazing. Truly, the psalmist was right when he or she declared this. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. We are physically amazing, and as we've just seen, we're physically connected. 
Which brings me to a third way of um, understanding what it means to be made in the image of God, which is that we are relational beings. God is presented in scripture as being relational. God is described through the metaphor of multiple persons. Traditionally, we think of, of God as being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we know God is not literally three different people, two of whom are male. We know that that's just a metaphor. That works in some ways. Some ways it's helpful, some ways it's, it's less helpful for some of us. Um, but clearly it's not perfect, it's just a metaphor. But God is clearly portrayed throughout scripture in different metaphors as being relational. Um, if you were here for some of our previous series, uh, you might remember that we've talked about God um, through the metaphor of being a divine dance of, of three um, persons, as it were. I think we have a picture of that, if you could put that up. Uh, for want of a better term, three uh, persons flowing in and out of one another in an eternal relationship of love. So Matthew's been speaking uh, the last two Sundays about how God is. God is being. God is an active verb. And that active verb is love. God is love. And love is um, produced and multiplied and demonstrated through relationships. Uh, and we looked at that in the specific context of putting others first and uh, serving one another last week. And we'll actually look at relationships in general um, next week when we get to the multiplayer experience of God Quest in game four. But engaging in loving relationships is one way in which uh, we live out what it means to be made in the image of God. In the Christian scriptures, Jesus is described as being the, the ultimate, the complete image of God. Uh, you might remember we read uh, these verses in Colossians, uh, actually both of the last two weeks, so you should know them by now, but we'll read them again this week too. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So as we talked about last week, our mission is to love like Jesus, to love like Jesus loves, in order to further that goal of bringing healing and reconciliation to our world. We are made in the image of God to love like God. So this is our collective backstory to function like God, uh, to, to have the characteristics of God, and uh, to relate like God. Uh, to care for, to treasure our world, to be rational, moral, creative, free-willed, spiritual people, to live in loving relationships, to live uh, in, that, in that medium of love. Uh, Matthew described it as a, a sponge in an ocean, but to, to live uh, absorbing the love of God and to let that flow through us uh, to others. But I'll be honest with you, most days I don't particularly feel like I am made in God's image. Okay, big confession there. Uh, I don't feel like I'm an amazing, empowered being that is swimming in an ocean of love. Particularly Monday mornings, it's not my best time to feel like, yes, I'm there. Most of the time, in fact, honestly, I, I kind of feel like I'm getting by, I'm hanging in there, you know, doing my best, but it's not really all that much to speak of. Um, I should probably be more, I should be doing more, I should uh, be better than I am. Does anyone else feel like that or is it, is it just, oh thank you, thank you, a couple of hands going up. Glad it's not just me wallowing in my sense of inadequacy, but, but I think that's a shame. I think actually we all feel that, right, at least sometimes. And that's no surprise because our culture constantly tells us a different backstory. Not that we are made in the image of the God of love but rather that we were made for other reasons. Like we were created to be consumers. We were created um, to acquire things. You know, life's a big competition to see who can get the most stuff. Who's got the nicest car and the biggest house and the, and the exotic vacations or whatever. 
Or if life's not actually a competition, then at least it's a quest for comfort and ease and convenience that things can give us. So it's all about getting more things. That's what life is all about. That's what we were created for. And if we get enough things, then life will be good. And if we don't get more things, well, we're a bit of a failure, really. That's a message we're actually told constantly, particularly through different forms of um, advertising, right? We're told that again and again. Jesus told um, this parable, uh, which makes us see that this is not a new phenomenon. I think this has been always going on. Uh, I can't quite see the edge, so I'm going to read from this. Um, then he said to them, Jesus said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And then I'll store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Now this is not saying that possessions are wrong, possessions are inherently evil, it's, or that the comfort and security that we can get from possessions is wrong. It's just that life is so much more than that. That is not what life is all about. We were created for much more than stuff. And if you don't fall for that lie that you were created to be a consumer, maybe you'll fall for the next one, which is that we were created to be producers. Uh, we need to achieve things. We need to do something with our lives. Uh, we need, and it needs to be something big, something flashy, right? Something to prove ourselves, to earn people's respect and love. Um, and, and then that's what life is all about. Again, there's nothing wrong, per se, in wanting to do something with your life. In fact, I think that's a good thing. I think it's natural. Um, I think it's good to want to do something with your life. But when we measure our whole identity, our whole purpose, our whole value by what we think we've achieved or failed to achieve, that's when I think it can all go horribly wrong. I had a friend um, call me a, a couple of years ago to tell me that her husband of almost 30 years uh, had suddenly announced that he was uh, serving her with divorce papers, that he'd actually quit his job already and was in the process of moving right across to the other side of the country. Now you never really know what goes off in someone else's marriage, but it seems he suddenly had um, this, this point in his life, he's in his mid-50s, where he thought, is this it? This wife, this house, this job, is this all there is for me? Is this what my life is? And of course, that is in no way unique, right? That's quite common. We have a phrase for it, your midlife crisis, right? We see that happen a lot. Um, because we feel like we're meant to achieve something big, something, you know, that's, that's meaningful, that, that, that is just so much more than we are, that we're not enough. That we should have risen to the top of the corporate ladder or we should have achieved financial security or, or we should have cured cancer or we should, we should have done something, right? Uh, and at least we should have a perfect family. We should have an adoring spouse and, and well-adjusted kids and, you know, we should have it all together. And if we don't, well, either we're a failure or we've been robbed, we've been cheated, life owes us. We were meant to do all that kind of stuff. And we have every right to feel bitter and, and cynical and, and not very good about ourselves or life in general. And that feeling of not very good about ourselves leads to another lie that we're told, which is that we are a bit of a disaster. Uh, we need fixing. We're basically a project. That's, that's who we are. We need, to, we need to exercise more and go on a diet. We need to declutter and get organized. We need to master the habits of highly effective people and learn the power of positive thinking and a thousand other things, right? And then if we do all that, if we get fixed up in all these different ways, then we'll be worthy. Then we'll be happy. Then we will be worth loving. Don't get me wrong. Again, obviously there are... Um, there's nothing wrong with wanting to improve. And we all have areas of our life we know we should be working on, right? It would be healthy for us to be working on those areas. But that's not who we are. Our failings, our weaknesses, the things that we don't like us about ourselves, they are not our identity. And religion, of course, 
is a prime culprit here, right? Many churches I have been to seem obsessed by my sin, by my weaknesses, my failings, my shortcomings. And I'm not denying for one second um, that I have plenty of those. And, and, and many of you know that firsthand, right? But they are not my identity. I think that's the difference between guilt and shame, right? We can, we can feel guilt. We know we've done something wrong. We know we ought to fix it. And that usually is a very positive thing because it keeps us on track. It, it makes us live a, a life that, that is healthy and good for us and good for other people. But shame, shame says not just I've done something wrong, but I am wrong. That's who I am. There's nothing I can do about it. That's just who I am. That's my identity. Shame is toxic. And it is the opposite of being made in the image of God. So in this context, I can say, I am not a sinner. Again, I know I fail, I sin, I fall short constantly. But that's not who I am. That is not my God-given identity. I am someone who is made in the image of God. One of my favorite stories about Jesus and, and Jesus' interactions with other people is this one from John chapter 8. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who had heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. What do we usually call this story? What do we call this story? Nobody? What's the title usually above the story? You can call out. Okay, you're all feeling very shy. It's usually called The Woman Caught in Adultery. I hate that title, right? Firstly, it could just as easily have been called the man suspiciously not caught in adultery, right? <laughs> just saying. Second, that's not who she is. That's how the religious authorities saw her. She is an adulterer. She should be got rid of. End of story. That's who she is. But that's not how Jesus sees her. She doesn't begin and end with her sin. We don't know anything about her, right? And presumably neither did Jesus. It doesn't say that he'd ever seen this woman before. Maybe she had a beautiful garden. Maybe she made extra spicy hummus that she used to bring to the community events. Maybe she was great with old people and really, uh, really compassionate. We don't know. We don't know anything about it. But we do know there was way more to this woman than her acts of adultery. Jesus says that she's someone who can leave that behind and live another way. That is not who she is. That is, does not define her. Her sin does not define her. She is more than that. If we believe we are defined by what we've done or what we have failed to do, by what we've achieved or, or failed to achieve, or by, by the mistakes we've made or by the things we have, we make it very difficult for us to love ourselves or to see God in ourselves. In fact, we're more likely to feel pretty depressed, uh, bitter, frustrated, fearful. We're more likely to feel like we're swimming in anti-love rather than love, to use, to use uh, Matthew's phrase from last week. Not loving ourselves is not the same as humility, right? We can say with all humility, I am made in God's image and I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I make mistakes all the time. I fall short all the time. But I am made in God's image and I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Not loving ourselves, putting ourselves down, constantly criticizing ourselves makes it very hard for us to love the God who created us and to love the people around us. So when we get those messages externally or when, when we hear it in our head uh, that we've internalized telling us that we're not enough, we're not good enough, we don't have enough, we've not achieved enough, we need to remember our collective backstory. 
We need to remember who we really are. Paul, one of the uh, early church leaders, uh, wrote this in a letter to uh, the church in Rome. He said, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. We don't need to feel fearful, oppressed, weighed down. We don't need to feel that we are not enough. We are not slaves to what our culture says that we need to be. We are children of God. We are made in God's image and we are amazing. There's a, a really beautiful verse in uh, the book of Zephaniah, uh, which probably the only verse in Zephaniah anyone reads, but it is beautiful and it, and it says this, for the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. Just let that soak in for a moment. God rejoices over you with joyful songs. An amazing concept. We are children of God. We are enough. We are loved just as we are right now. I have a, a picture above my desk that was sent to me by uh, someone I love very much who struggles with depression, as, as um, I do. Some of you know that. Uh, and I love this picture. Um, it says, on the darkest of days, when I feel inadequate, unloved, and unworthy, I remember whose daughter I am, and I straighten my crown. So I want to encourage you to remember who you are and to straighten your crown. And I want to invite up now a friend of mine, Caroline, to share a little bit about how she has learned to straighten her crown or is maybe still learning. I, I would say she probably doesn't think she's arrived. So let's give her a round of applause. So Caroline, maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself for those of us who, for those who don't sure. know. Sure. Oh, oh, there it is. He's on it. Um, good job, John. Uh, I'm Caroline Ferrante. I've been coming to Cedar Ridge, I think it's been about 12 years. Every time I count it up, it's different. So if that's different than something else I said, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and uh, I'm originally from the south side of Chicago. This is my husband, Ken, over here. And we have a blended family of three kids, uh, two over 20 and one in high school. And we live in a little townhouse. So that's our life. Um, <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. So did anything I say resonate with you at all? Do you feel that you struggle to see God in yourself? Or, or do you, right, every Monday morning you're like, I'm there, I'm swimming in God's love, and I'm awesome and wonderfully created? Oh, no. Oh, gosh. My whole, whole life I've really struggled um, with, with who I am and, and trying to grasp, number one, a, a loving God. Um, and then number two, a God that isn't somehow in my earthly father's image. And if it's okay, I'll give a little yeah, that backstory on that. Um, so uh, I was severely abused from the time I was four in every way. And um, my father even enjoyed uh, causing pain, so torture. And he would tell me when he was inflicting pain on me, um, you don't feel this, this isn't happening, you made me do this, things like that. And when you're four years old and, and on and you're hearing this from someone that you should trust, why would, I, why would I not believe him? So this idea of who I am and what I deserve has been colored from a really, oh, thanks, static, um, has been colored by um, a really warped, uh, point of view, if, if that makes sense. And uh, my mother then, uh, who didn't have the courage to protect both me and my sister, uh, then taught us a very kind of compulsive form of Christianity where everything that happens, God let it happen because we deserved it, and maybe if we could get better, it would stop happening. So my whole life has been colored by this idea that, um, no, I'm not good enough, and I'm so bad that I made this wonderful man do horrible things to me. And then a third kind of nugget in there that's really colored my whole perspective of myself is that um, I, I can't even tell you how many times I heard growing up, you're not supposed to be here. 
you're a mistake from my brother, from my sister, from my mother and my father. I wasn't a planned pregnancy, but even I would hear everything was so much better before you were born. And so it's literally not until about five years ago, <laughs> I mean recently, that it, it suddenly dawned on me one morning, hey, you know, I'm starting to feel like maybe I'm supposed to be here. And that was just, I, I can't even tell you exactly how that happened. I'm very grateful it happened, but you know, I, I think being here for 12 years and being in this community has transformed me. Um, but slowly but surely, things are changing. But uh, I guess to answer your question, that has been the greatest struggle of my life. So, so what have you done to try and counteract those, those incredibly hurtful and negative messages? I mean, was it just you woke up one morning? I mean, I, mean, I, th I think mm -hmm. you've, you've tried to work that out. Oh, yeah. What, what would you say to other people who may be struggling with some of that? Well, um, I guess number one, I want to say, I don't think there's any one path. I, I mean, I think we're all very different. So I, um, I kind of compulsively read Christian self-help books, and always at the end they have the five-step process or the three-step. Has anybody read those books? So, I mean, I read every book. I did everything. And, I, and so sometimes I would glom on if people say, oh, we'll just do this, this, and this. And I guess I'm realizing now there may be different things I glean from all those books I read, um, but bottom line is I've just had to um, get out and fight that fight every day. Mm -hmm. um, but what has worked? I would say about, um, it was probably about five years ago, I started to realize how unhealthy my prayer life was. And I'd been reading the Bible straight through every year since I think I was 10. And, I, and I, I started to realize that these practices were actually not serving me. They were in some way confirming this image of God that I had in my head that was really kind of modeled from my father and from the God that was described to be my, by my mother. Does that make sense? I'm not saying reading the Bible is bad, I'm not saying praying is bad, but the way I was approaching it, which was out of this total mindset of fear, and how am I going to survive? And how can I try to get this vengeful God from destroying me again and again? That kind of mindset. And so I decided to stop. <laughs> so um, ironically, it was by dropping some, some practices that a lot of people find very helpful. I had to let those go. And so instead, I slowly just started to try meditation. Um, and I, I would just sit on my couch in the front room. I think I was just really depressed at the time. And I started to just notice how beautiful the sycamore trees are right in front of our townhouse. And somehow that began a journey, which I believe just began with God, helping me be comfortable. I felt so naked letting go of all those kind of compulsive things I was doing so I would feel Christian, so I would feel safe, like I was doing the right stuff and so I wasn't gonna get struck down or have something horrible happen. Um, and over time, I started to realize um, that as I let my feelings peel away and even my thoughts peel away, some of those really negative thoughts that hold me back and would cause me to go into unhealthy patterns, um, behind all that, there was a presence. And, and that's when I started to realize that God was so much bigger. And, and I started to experience a wonder that I had never experienced in my, my lifelong pursuit of Christianity. And in fact, it even made me wonder if indeed I ever really was a Christian. I don't know. Um, but it, it was, I was worshiping a God that was in the image of my family and their power structure. And in the last five years, thankfully, I've been able to strip that away and start to see God on God's terms. And slowly but surely, the words come back. Mostly my prayers are, oh, help, help God, oh, help, things like that. <laughs> but often, um, I just find that every day, time in meditation, where I just quiet myself and where I'm honest with myself, um, that that's where I start to feel this connection with something bigger than me, something bigger than the universe, so vast I can't understand it, and somehow that's comforting. The second thing, am I talking too long? No, absolutely. Okay. Um, this, I can wander. Um, the second Great. thing, and I think I saw Melanie here today, sorry Melanie, you're behind the music stand, um, is that once Melanie was speaking, and she um, introduced me, I think it was the first time I heard about the welcoming prayer, 
And um, it really stuck with me and started to use that in conjunction with my meditation practice and my kind of prayer practice. And, uh, and so then being able to be quiet, making myself available to God's presence, starting to realize there is something that's not based in fear. What if it's love? Starting to believe that more and more every day over the years. And then as those feelings come up that make me very afraid, things from my past, being able to say, I'm gonna welcome them. They can come sit by, you know, beside me on my meditation couch and, and I'm just gonna, for example, this morning, I was really nervous about this. I, I sometimes have trouble when I'm talking about things from my past because it was, it was really traumatic. And um, so as I was meditating, the, the, I just kept thinking, gosh, what if I get it wrong? What if I mess it up? What if I say something wrong? What if I swear in the microphone? Like I was <laughs> thinking all these things. Um, and then I decided, well, you know, I'm just gonna let uh, failure come and have a seat next to me. Okay, yeah, I might fail. I've been at this church long enough that I, I know you guys will still love me and accept me anyway. But you know, it's, it's that kind of, med it's not just a meditation where I'm trying to check out, rather it's more of a meditation that allows me to really check in in more of a, not a surface way, but in a deeper way where I'm more authentic with God. I don't know if that makes sense. So, so rather than you kind of reaching out to God with through certain practices, you just kind of really welcoming God in, in, in all of that, in the negative and in the positive and every part of you. I'm not trying yeah, to put words uh, into no, you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I think so. And also God's surprising me mm -hmm. with bringing up things that I, I probably would not have put on my to-do list to talk with God about. But, but then I realized, oh yeah, this is actually more foundational. I need to kind of deal with this emotion or, or whatever feeling I'm, I'm dealing with. So. Awesome. Yeah. Let's give Caroline a very Thank you. large round of applause. Thank you, my friend. So our challenge then this week is to level up our character. That's the title of the of, of this week's message, but not by getting more, doing more, being more, improving, but by recognizing who we already are, recognizing God in ourselves, or recognizing God in the positive and in the negative, recognizing God's presence in every part of our lives. And I have no doubt that during this week, um, each of us is going to be assailed by various feelings of inadequacy, unworthiness. Um, we may feel shame, fear. Uh, we may just feel completely distracted and stressed out about all the things that we haven't done and all the things that we're not. Uh, but whenever we have those feelings, that self-criticism, negative thoughts about who we are, let's go back and remember who we really are, our true backstory, um, that we are made in God's image. Uh, and I, of course, I'm not talking about uh, critical thoughts that, we, that might be positive. Uh, you know, if we say something in ki unkind, we don't want to just say, well, that's who I am. I mean, we, wanna, we want to have those kind of critical uh, feelings where we, we stop and we, we change. But when our thoughts go to, I'm a bad person, that's who I am, that sense of shame, uh, let's remember who we really are. So if you catch yourself uh, thinking those negative things, stop, remind yourself that you are a child of God. You are amazing, you are unique, you are made in God's image. God loves you unconditionally and rejoices over you with singing. And there are some suggestions uh, in the materials that you might want to look at, practical ways um, that you can uh, put yourself in a position where, where you might be able to uh, focus on that a little bit more. So we're going to uh, take communion uh, in just a moment as we do each week. Um, and we eat and we drink symbolically as a reminder that we are loved unconditionally by God, that God calls us friends. Uh, which is just an amazing thing if you stop and think about it. Communion, of course, is, is a very symbolic act. It's a reenactment of, of Jesus' uh, last meal with his disciples, his closest friends, on the night uh, before he died. And we are invited into that meal. We are invited into that intimate space with Jesus. We're invited into that friendship. And everybody is welcome. Uh, we don't need to hang back because we feel unworthy or, or inadequate or unwanted. We are all welcome at the table together. Not because of something we've done, not because of something we believe, but because of who we are. We are children made in God's image who are welcome in God's presence. 
So we're going to take uh, communion now. Um, there are other ways to respond to. Um, if you would like to pray with someone, there'll be people uh, in this back corner that would love to pray with you. If there's something weighing on your heart, please don't go uh, without talking to someone. We'd love to pray with you. You can also write out a prayer and put it into the frames under Grow and Journey. If you put it into those frames, uh, there's a team of people that will uh, pray for you during the week. Um, you can also light a candle, uh, make a financial gift, uh, respond in whatever way feels um, appropriate to you. Um, but uh, let's, you can also just sit and enjoy God's presence. Uh, let's pray together. It's cause ours. Almighty God, we look at the wonder of your creation and it's easy to see that is good. Uh, but for many of us, uh, we look at ourselves and we struggle. We hear so many different voices and we've got so much from our past. We struggle to say that we are good, that you've created us to be awesome, beautiful children that you love. I just pray that you would um, take away that fear of being unworthy, of, of being unloved, of being um, inadequate, that you would open our eyes in a new way to the depth and the unconditional nature of your love for each one of us, um, that you delight in us, that you rejoice over us with joyful songs. I pray that that would really sink in deep down inside of us and that that would just well up within us and we would be able to love others with that same kind of love. I pray that you would reach us at the place where we need uh, your healing. We need to know um, your love and your acceptance. Amen. So when you